All right. So what I want to start uh, with is I just want to explain one or two things before we go to our main examples that I've sent in the call. So I believe uh, most of you had the opportunity to attend one of those introduction classes that we have done. So I'm not going to go through a lot of introduction stuff because I believe you guys have uh, had an opportunity to do that. But what I want mainly to go through is some key issues uh, to do with um, to do with concepts, accounting concepts, because I think those are the main issues that will affect how we think about accounting. All right, accounting concepts. Okay, these ones. So if you understand accounting concepts, you will notice that most of the stuff that we talk about, you understand. So right. we'll spend maybe 15 or so minutes just on accounting concepts, and then we can go directly into our calculations. All right. So when we started the study module and we defined what accounting was all about, right? We stated that uh, whenever you are doing accounting or whenever you are reporting the finances of an organization, there is a certain standard way of doing accounting. There is a certain standard way of doing accounting or of presenting information. Right. And this standard way is called the general accepted accounting what practices, right? So that's the accepted way of doing accounting. Now, under this accepted way, there are generic principles that you should understand about accounting, which govern the principles of how you prepare reports. So the reports that you are asked to prepare in unit number two, which is the income statement, the statement of financial position, and the cash flow statement, the basis of creating those reports are from understanding what accounting are concepts are. Understand accounting concepts, then unit number two will be very, very straightforward for you. Right? Unit number two will be what? Will be very, very straightforward for you. So you need to understand what accounting concepts are. Then you can understand unit number two, which is preparation of financial uh, statements, which is what we want to do today. Right? We want to do preparation of financial statements. The first unit is just theory. I don't think anyone can struggle with theory. You guys can read theory or you can watch the previous video. It's just theory, there's nothing to it. But in that theory, there is accounting concepts. So that's what I want to talk about, accounting concepts, right? So once you understand accounting concepts, then we can go into our workings for unit number two. All right. So accounting concepts, the first accounting concept says that our accounting entity, right? So we are saying that when you are recording organization. Now, remember everything that we are saying, we are giving you the assumption that you are an accountant and you are doing accounting for an organization, right? That's what unit two is all about, right? It's about you being an accountant and doing some accounts for an organization. So when you are recording within your books, within your accounting books, right? There's a concept called accounting entity. Now, accounting entity, we are saying that you should only record transactions that are related to the organization. If it's not related to the organization, do not include it in your accounting entries. So, for example, if I own a business, right, Varsity Unlimited Tutors, that's my company, right? I own a business, Varsity Unlimited Tutors, right? And when I am recording the transactions, right, I should say Varsity Unlimited Tutors used bond paper. Varsity Unlimited Tutors used the internet. Varsity Unlimited Tutors purchased some diaries, right? So those are the different expenses of Varsity Unlimited Tutors. But however, because I am the owner, of varsity and limited tutors. Sometimes, you know, as owners, we can do things that are dubious. So for example, at the end of the month, the landlord wants his rent out, right? And I don't have money in my personal account. Because I am the owner of varsity and limited tutors, I can decide to use the varsity and limited tutors account and then pay the landlord. But the rent that I'm paying, it's not for Varsity Unlimited Tutors offices. It's for my personal office. It's for my what? It's for my personal office, right? So because it's for my personal office, that transaction is not for Varsity Unlimited Tutors. 
although I have used Varsity Unlimited to test account. So what should I do at the end of the year? So what should I do at the end of the day is I should remove that from my rent expenses because it's not rent for Varsity Unlimited to test. Rather, I should record it as a withdrawal from the business, what is called a drawing that has been done by the owner of the business. If it is not clear, please highlight because we're not going to repeat this, right? So that's accounting entity concept. I hope that's clear to everyone. Go to the next one. The next one is the money measurement concept. Right? The money measurement concept simply states that when you are preparing your financial statements, right, you don't prepare financial statements by adding goats, by adding cows, by adding computers, by adding all of these different things. You don't prepare financial statement by adding runs, by adding puller, by adding dollars. You have to summarize everything in one currency, which is monetary in value, right? Which means that if you have done some business deals where you have exchanged certain things and no money was exchanged, you need to value those things and put them into monetary terms. So that is why in a financial statement, if you go to Vodacom's financial statement right now, it will not tell you that uh, we have a, a building uh, at corner blah, blah, blah in Johannesburg, and then we've got another building at corner blah, blah, blah in Deben. No, they don't do that. They just tell you land, property, and buildings. In total, the value is three billion. That's what they tell you. That's enough. For, for an accountant. We don't want to know the nitty gritties, the square meters and what, no, that's nothing that does not interest us. What interests us is the financial value. And again, in runs of that specific what? Of that specific asset or liability, right? So that's money measurement concept. I hope this is clear to everyone. Is someone is saying they can't hear anything. Am I audible, guys? Yes, James. Yes, we can hear you. All right. I think yes, there. we can hear James. All right, fine. So that's what that's money measurement concept, right? The next concept is called the materiality concept. The materiality concept is the reason why you notice in accounting we round up things, we round figures up. We don't say uh, the, the, it was comma, 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 comma. We just round it to the nearest whole number or something like that. That's materiality, right? So materiality, we're saying that when you are doing accounting, there are things that are small. There are things that are big. You can ignore things that are small or you can lump them up together. You don't need to know the details. You don't need to have a balance sheet, for example, that tells you that, oh, we've got a... Uh, Five dollars in petty cash, and then we've got five hundred thousand in the bank account, and then we've got six hundred thousand in our money market investments. Rather, if you check on the, the statement of financial position, it says cash and cash equivalent three billion, right? It means that they've lumped up all of those things that are immaterial to provide you one figure that is material. So anything that is miscellaneous in nature, you don't record it one by one. Okay, what happened here? Okay, you don't record it one by one, right? You just lump it up together and you get one specific figure for all of those things. You don't need to have unnecessary categories in your financial statement. Otherwise, it will become too long. You don't need unnecessary categories in your financial statement. So you notice some of the things that we teach you. If you go to, 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 to Vodacom's financial statement, you not see them. For example, we talk about rental expenses, we talk about insurance expenses. If you go and check Vodacom right now, it's financial statements that they publish, you will not see all of those things because they are saying these things are immaterial. They will just tell you that the total operating expenses were three billion and they are done. The nitty gritty part, they are not worried about that because it is immaterial to them. So that's what we are essentially saying at the end of the day. So that's the materiality concept. The next one is called the historic concept. The historic concept we were saying when we are recording assets, when we are recording assets, we need to take into consideration the cost of the asset, right? We say the cost of the asset less the accumulated depreciation. We don't record assets at their market value, but at the cost less 
the depreciation that has been what that has been accumulated so the historic cost what did we buy the asset for so you might notice that an asset might be recorded on a statement of financial position building and they might say that the building was uh purchased for one million rand and the depreciation maybe is uh, 500,000. So the building is worth 5,000 on the balance sheet. But if you go to a real estate company, the building might be worth 3 million at the end of the day. So that's one of the weaknesses of, of, of accounting also is the issue of the historic concept. We record assets at their historic cost less the accumulated depreciation of that asset. All right. I hope it's clear to everyone. Next one is called the double entry principle the double entry principle. This one I will explain it a little bit in detail, but let me jump it for now. I'll come back to it. I'll explain it in detail because it's something that I want to show you, right? The next one is called the going concept, going concern concept. The going concern concept is tied to the issue of historic cost. Going concern, we're saying that when we are preparing financial statements, we assume that the business is going to continue operating. That's what our assumption the business is going to continue operating into the future, right? The business is going to continue operating into the future. So if it does not continue operating into the future, then there is a problem. We have to revisit how we do the financial statements. Usually when we know that the business is going to be closed, we record our financial statements, what we call the net realizable value. But as long as we know that there is a going concern concept, then we assume the historic cost when we are preparing our financial statements. So we prepare our financial statements based on the historic concept. Why? Because we believe the business will continue to operate into the future. Right. Then the accounting period. The accounting period, we assume that each financial statement that you're preparing is for a 12-month period unless otherwise stated. Right. So each financial statement that you'll be preparing, it will be for a 12 month period for the last year, unless you have been told otherwise. And normally you will notice it will be as a 28th February. That is usually the year end, 28th February. The year end is not usually December. Sometimes some questions, some lecturers might give you December, but most lecturers, they will give you 28th February. So if it gives you 31 December, good. If it gives you 28 February, good. Just know that that's a concept where saying there is a specific financial year end. You should know what your financial year end is when you are preparing accounting uh, 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 statements of, 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 of financial statements of an organization. Right. Then these ones are now, are now the interesting ones, which will affect quite a lot of things. So there's what we call the matching concept. The matching concept, we are saying that the revenues of an organization should be matched to the expenses of an organization, right? So, for example, if we are to have a project that is going to last us three years, so, for example, uh, maybe we are a construction company and we are building a stadium and we are building it over three years. So if we have a project that is going to last us three years, therefore the revenues and the expenses of that project should be appropriately matched over the three years. Which means that if in year number one, we do 50% of the project, then 50% of the revenue should be allocated to year number one. And 50% of the costs should be allocated to year number one. If in year number two, we do 30% of the project, then 30% of the revenue should be allocated to year number two and 30% of the cost should be allocated to year number two. So that is the matching concept. Revenues and expenses for projects that go for more than one year should be matched together into the specific year that they are in. So this concept is similar to, uh, I'm gonna jump here, to what is called the accruals concept. The accruals concept now says this. Now, the accruals concept, whenever you have expenses or sometimes revenues, right, for a specific year, right, which you know that these expenses are for this year, even if you do not pay those expenses, even if you do not receive that revenue, but as long as it is for that specific year, and as long as you know one of these days you have to pay or receive that money, record it in the appropriate year. So for example, 
I use water with my own, right? So if I use water right now, I've used the water. And then at the end of the month, I receive a bill and I don't pay it. And then I go throughout the whole year, use the water from the city council, but not paying the bill. And then I decide I'm going to pay my water bill in 2024, in 2024. That's my decision. But when I do my financial statements for this year, for 2023, I should record that I had an expense for water and take that bill and record it, regardless of whether I have paid for that bill or not, because I've already used that water and it was an expense for this particular year. Yes, uh, the, the slide I can send the slide. Hi, to. James. Yes, Hello. Hi, James. Yes. You really confused us guys today because now I've been in, in another class. Confuse you for? I've, I've just coming from, there was, I think that there's a two links that you guys have sent us. I'm just coming from a, an economic class. Um, Same here, I was there and- And that's not fair because now I've been listening to that for like 20 minutes. Me well, too, I have been here. in economic class. Me too. Uh, I'm not sure what happened here, guys. Um, you sent us you sent us two links today. the first one you sent it was about six o'clock it was for business finance and then mm -hmm. later you sent economics and then we went to economics class i stayed there maybe about 15 minutes then i realized that we have another class uh, is it me who sent that link Yes, yeah. you received it from Should the same group. It's the, from the same group, from the business. The uh, you, I see it's actually Eugene sent the first link and then uh, the second link as well. So. Oh, yeah. Please um, let the confusion not happen again because now we've lost this site. Okay, it's fine. My apologies. I didn't know that's what happened. Um, All right, just give me a second. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, what's up? Sit up straight and watch your Popeyes or something. My sister, can you mute your uh, uh, sugar. phone, please? Okay, uh, my apologies guys. I think maybe there was a mix up on the link. I'm not really sure what happened. Can I, uh, James, can I ask something as well? Because yes. on the other side, they are busy with the assignment for economics. Does no, it's, they... it's, it's, a, it's a completely different university. Oh, okay. A completely different university. It's nothing to do with you guys. James, I think he just deleted the one that that is on the, the economics one, on the business finance one, so that people don't go to it. Okay.
Alright. Okay, invite. But it's, it's fine. All right, uh, I was explaining about, uh, where was I? Accruals principle, right? So like I was saying, accruals principle, we are basically saying that at the end of the day, if you have an expense and that expense is for a particular year, regardless of whether you've paid for that expense or not, you should record that expense in its appropriate year. So you can see how it matches with the issue of the matching concept, right? So that's the accruals concept, right? Then after the accruals concept, our uh, conservatism. Can I take you back on the accruals uh, principle, please? Now, uh -huh. you, you make an example. Let's say I was supposed to pay for a particular um, service provider in the financial year 2021, 2022. Mm -hmm. and they were not paid. Mm -hmm. When do they become the accrual? In the 22-23 financial year or in that particular year that they were supposed to be paid? All right. So the accrual part, now let, let me, because it's going to affect, remember you've got two statements. You've got the statement of financial position and you've got the statement of comprehensive income. We are going to do this as examples when we do the, the, the workings, right? But in just terms, in terms of explaining, in your statement of financial position, accruals apply like this. If you have not paid for the expense, right, but you have enjoyed the service, please make sure that under your expenses, it is fully recorded. If it was 20,000, the bill, but you have not yet paid it, but you've enjoyed the service, make sure that under your expenses, in the initial financial year, uh, for, for your example, that's what, that's uh, 20, 2021, 2022, right? Make sure that you've recorded it, right? Then in the balance sheet for your current year, right, which is 2021, 2021, 2022, in the balance sheet for your current year, you then record it as an accrued expense, which means you are going to pay it off next year in 2023. That's what we are saying. You record it as a crude expense. In your income statement, you expense it. You have to record the full expense that this was for this year, right? And then in your statement of financial position, you record it under your liabilities. And you say, I owe these people money for something that they provided me, but I have not yet paid them. So you record them as a liability accrued expenses. Right. So that's what, that's the accrual uh, principle. So when we do the examples, I will tell you that here we are applying this principle, here we are applying this principle so that you can come back to what we are explaining here, right? Uh, conservatism principle. Conservatism principle, we are basically saying that you need to be conservative in your presentation of financial information. So for example, let's say that um, Lungile owes me 300,000 rand, right? Lungile owes me 300,000 rand. But I know Lungile's financial situation. And I know that most likely she's going to pay me 250,000. The other 50,000, to be honest, she's never going to pay me that money. She doesn't have it, 
right? So according to accounting, I cannot then go and record in my financial position that Lumile is a debtor and she owes me 300,000. Yes, she might owe me 300,000, but I know she's not going to pay it because she does not have the money. So I only record the money that I know she will pay, which is 250,000. So the other 50,000, option number one, right, is I can completely write it off as an expense, which is bad debts, right? I'm saying this is a bad debt. This person is never going to pay me back. Or option number two, which is in the statement of financial position, right? I can record it as a provision for bad debts, as in this person is doubtful that they will pay me money. They might, they might not pay me money. I don't know. It's very, very doubtful. So I'm going to say my debtors, which was supposed to be 300,000, less the 50,000 uh, provision for doubtful debtors. I don't think these people will pay me. So that's conservatism principle, right? And then um, the other one was what? Uh, realization principle. Realization principle is that uh, whenever we are recording our income, right, we only can record income that has been earned and income that has been realized. If income is not earned and is not realized, we cannot record. The same thing with what? With expenses. You can only record it, it has been incurred and if it has been what? Realized that it has been what? Incurred. So it's almost like a counter to the issue of accruals and the issue of matching. We are saying that although we told you to record everything, but record it only if it has been realized. So there are certain things, you know, how people, how people record things that are fictitious, you know, these scandals that happen. This is the principle that they will be relying on whenever there are scandals, the realization principle. Because it's very vague in terms of what can you call something that has been realized or something that has not been realized. So, for example, if I am selling like Amazon, remember Amazon, they do shipping, right? Or let's, let's, let's talk about Mr. D in South Africa. Mr. D, they do deliveries, right? So, for example, if the customer comes in and says, I want a product, right? and they make an order of the product, and they say cash on delivery. That's what they written, cash on delivery, right? And then you transport the order, right? Have you made the sale or have you not made the sale? Do you see how tricky it becomes? Have you made the sale or have you not made the sale? If the client had signed an IOU, like this is credit, I'm going to pay you on the 31st, that's fine. You can record it as a sale. But this client has said, this is cash on delivery, which means when the driver gets there, they should receive cash, which means before the driver receives cash, that sale has not yet been made. Because if the driver does not receive, does not get there, that sale is not made. If the driver does not receive the cash there, you have lost that product. If it's food that has been cooked and the driver does not receive the cash, that is a loss that you have made. Is because that client can refuse to pay. Because he said cash on delivery, and then when you deliver, he says, I don't want to pay. So it's not a sell. So that's what we're saying, realization. The sell has to be realized. It has to be a real sell at the end of the day. If it's not real, then it cannot be recorded. So that's now is a counter to the issue of accruals and matchings, where you are saying there are certain transactions that you have not received money for. Do they fall under the matching and accruals concept or do they fall under the realization concept? Have they been realized or have they not yet been realized at the end of the what? at the end of the day. Or another example, you know these organizations like uh, maybe Cartrick, right? They have subscriptions. So if a person, let's say, has got a debit order and they are not paying that their debit order, let's say they close, they, they, they do know how people are. They take money from the account and then the debit order goes and hits, but it is not paid. And they do that for six months. Should they continue recording each month that they are making a sale? when clearly they can see that this client has, is no longer interested. But can they, because on contract, they have a contract with the client for the next 12 months, but the client is not paying. You see, those are some of the concepts that they are getting to that. But for you guys, don't need to worry about this concept. I have never seen a lecturer getting deeper into this concept. But for those that are going to pursue accounting at an advanced level, this is actually a very important concept at the end of the day, right? So that's... Um, realization concept. So we're left with one concept here. So we've highlighted uh, accruals, 
We've talked about realization. We've talked about conservatism. We've talked about a matching concept. We've highlighted accounting period very straightforward. Uh, we've highlighted um, going concern, like I said, just assuming that the organization continues to work. Then a double entry is the one that I didn't do, right? Double entry is the one I'm going to come to it, right? And then uh, materiality, we highlighted it. So I think we've done all of this. All right, let's come back to double entry. So for double entry, I just want to explain a couple of things and then we can go to our workings, what we want to do today. Right. Okay, so double entry. So let me explain a couple of things on double entry. So whenever we are recording in accounting, this, this is just information for you guys. It's not really something that is critical, but you might see it in your KCQs in the assignments. But again, like I said, the assignments, I do the assignments with you guys, so it's not a problem. But you might see it in your assignments being asked. So that's something that you might just need to be aware of in case it comes in the what in the assignment, right? So in accounting, we say this double entry. Double entry means that for every credit that you are doing, there is a debit. So there is what we call a debit side and there's what we call a credit side in accounting. Right? You don't really need to go deep into that because you guys are not accountants, right? But just know that there's a debit side and a credit side in accounting, right? So this thing, which we call the accounting equation is what is important. Assets is equals to equity plus liabilities. Now, remember, I've already defined this. An asset, we said it's what? It's something of economic value that will give you a future economic benefit. For example, if you were to buy a building, if you were to buy a delivery truck, if you were to buy a, a, a plant and equipment, right? It's something of economic value that will give you a future economic benefit, right? Liability, we already highlighted that's you owing people money. That's what a liability is. It's you owing someone money, right? And then equity, equity is your contribution to the business. Equity is your contribution as the owner to the business. So assets, which is what you have, right? Your buildings, your vehicles, your stationery, your equipment, your furniture and fittings, that's your assets, what you have, is always equals to how did you buy it, which is your equity and your liabilities. So if I say, how did you buy it? And you say, oh, I used my own savings. It becomes what? Equity. If I say, how did you buy it? And you said, oh, I borrowed money from FNP. It becomes what? Liabilities. So assets are always equal to equity plus liabilities. So if assets are always equal to equity and liabilities, this is where we now talk about the double entry. It means every single time you have an increase in assets, there is to be a corresponding increase in what? either in equity or liabilities, because you are buying the asset using something. Either you're buying with your own money or you're buying with a liability, with a loan. So whenever there's an increase in assets, there's always going to be an increase in liabilities. So when you record that I have bought an asset, 500,000, you have to have a double entry on the other side where you record, I have contributed more money to the business, 500,000. You record, I have a new asset. I have bought a house, 1 million rand. You also record on the other side, I now have a loan from the bank, 1 million rand. So that's double entry. That's what we mean when we say double entry. We are recording on both sides of whatever is happening at the end of the day. You cannot record on one side only. If you record on one side, essential on this equation, right? on this equation, you're still going to do double entry. It's going to be an increase in something and a decrease in something so that the net effect is going to be zero at the end of the day. The net effect is going to be zero if you're dealing with only one side of the what? One side of the equation. So that's double entry for you. That's what double entry simply means, right? So there's an example here I, I, I did out of the previous class on double entry, where I was saying that, for example, you can purchase an asset in the form of a house. Right, and then that house you contribute. You, re you remember the deposit under thousand, and then you take a loan of nine hundred thousand. So the money that you contributed under thousand deposit, the down payment plus the money that you borrowed, the bond nine hundred thousand is equals to the value of the house, which is one million at the what at the end of the day. So that's what that's double interest. And then each transaction that you do, each transaction that you do, it will affect the same way. 
it will affect two things. It will always affect two things. You cannot record one transaction. It will always affect two things. That's double entry. So for example, if you decide I want to sell the asset, right? You want to sell the house, right? What are you going to do if you want to sell the house? You have to go and what and advertise, right? So if you have to go and advertise for you to sell the house, you need money to advertise. Where is the money coming from, right? So if you contribute the money yourself, it means you are adding to equity to the what to the business that you already have. This is the plus one thousand that you see here, right? Once you contribute to equity, it means also you are contributing cash one thousand. So you are going to affect assets in the form of cash. You are going to affect affect equity in the form of the extra one thousand that you have contributed. But when you put the advert on Google Ads or on the newspaper, you have to pay, right? The newspaper company for the advert that you're going to put. So when you pay the newspaper company for that advert, how do you pay them? You pay them using cash, which means you subtract the cash from the assets and you what? You subtract the money from the equity because it's a loss to you. Any loss that you encounter in a business is removed from equity. So you subtract the equity from you because it's a loss. So whatever you do, it will affect two things, no matter what it is at the end of the day. So that's double entry system for you, right? So I think I'm done with the principles. Now I can go directly uh, to what we really want to do today, which is the, um, the workings for unit number two. All right. Are there any questions on the principles before we go to the workings? Yes, uh, James, the, especially the one that you just uh, dealt with now. Actually, I, I could not see exactly on the, that 1,000 on the other side and 1,000 on the other side. I'm not, I'm not too sure if I, I follow that. All right, let's use a different example. Let's use a different example. Um, let's, uh, let's look here, my second point here. I hope you can see this. Right, so remember you have a house. Right, you have a house with one million. Right, you have a house with one million. That's how much your house is worth. And you paid for the house using hundred thousand equity, and using what? Using liabilities nine hundred thousand. Right. So that house is going to get charged. Remember, council rates taxes for the house. So at the end of the year, you are charged five thousand taxes for that house that you have. Right. So what happens when you are charged five thousand? Uh, taxes for that house. It's going to affect two things. Let's assume that you don't have money to pay for the taxes. So it's going to create a liability for you because you now owe the city council. Are we together there? It's going to create a liability because you now owe the city council. Are we together? Yes, I follow. Yes. So if you owe the city council, we are now saying you add 5,000 to the liabilities, right? Because you now owe the city council, which means you have an extra 5,000 on the what? On the liabilities. But remember what I just told you, whenever you make a loss in a business, it's removed from equity. So the 5,000 that you now owe city council, it's a loss to you because it's an expense. An expense is a loss, right? It's a loss to you. So we are saying the expense is removed from equity. And how much is the expense? It's 5,000, correct? Yes. yes. So if I say 900,000 plus 5,000, I'm going to get a figure here, right? I think it's going to be 895,000 or something like that, right? And then I say equity, 100,000 minus this 5,000, it's going to give me another figure. If I add up these things, if you want, you can try it on your calculator. You see, you still end up with 1,000 or 1 million at the end of the day. Do you follow? Yes, yes, I follow. Yes, so you end up with 1 million. So the reason why you're ending up with 1 million is because it's a double side, it's double entry. You cannot record a transaction once, you have to record it twice. So at the end of the day, number one, your equation is going to stay the same. Assets are always going to be equal to equity plus liabilities. Then number two, you cannot record that transaction once, you have to record it twice. That's the reason why assets are always equal to equity plus liabilities. So you're saying you're recording it, number one, as an increase in liabilities because you need to pay city council. You're recording it as a loss of equity because you have made an expense for the organization. So at the end of the day, double entry fulfilled. Number two, your assets are still equal to your equity plus liability. You can go even to the third one here. 
let's assume that you sell the house, right? You sell the house for 1,500,000. That's how much in what? You've sold the house for. So what is going to happen after you sell the house for what? For 1,500,000. You are going to get what? 1,500,000 for the house that you've what? That you've sold, right? But when you sell it for 1,500,000, how much profit have you made? You've made profit of 500,000, right? Because it was 1 million in the beginning, but you've now sold it for 1,500. So you've made a profit of 500,000. So if you've made a profit of 500,000, that's equity to you. Because profit is added to you, the owner of the business. Because remember, equity represents you, the owner of the business. So we take that profit and we add it to what? To equity. So you can see, again, you have recorded two things. You have recorded on one side, the increase in cash, and then on the other side, you've recorded the what? The new equity, the new uh, equity figure, which is the profit that you made. And again, you're going to see that your assets, which is now 1.5 million, is still equal to your equity plus your liabilities, which is also on the other side, 1.5 million. Okay, I hope it's clear now. That's, uh, that's yes. now, now, if, if you, you, you are registering, uh, 500,000 uh, on your equity just because you've uh, sold it for 1.5. Mm -hmm. Now, you're only going to put it on, a, on an equity and you do it in terms of liability, what's going to happen? The liability is still there because you have not yet paid the bank. You okay, then there's it. nothing. But that if you decide to pay the bank, look at this last entry. Here. I decided to pay the bank. Yeah. Look at this last point here. I've decided to pay the bank. Right, and I decide to pay the bank the nine hundred thousand that I owe them, and then they charge me an interest of hundred thousand. What happens? Right? So the first thing is for me to be able to pay the bank. What do I need to do first? Right. The first thing is number one, I need to pay them nine hundred thousand, which means I'm going to lose cash. So the one thousand five hundred cash that I had in the in the account, I'm going to say minus nine hundred, and then on the liability side, I had the liability of nine hundred thousand. I have paid it. I no longer owe them. I'm going to say minus 900,000. So again, I'm still going to end up with something that is equal. I'm going to have 600,000 on one side and 600,000 on the other side because I no longer have liabilities. So whatever entry that you do, you will notice it will affect two things at least. And your assets will always be equal to your liabilities. It will not change. Your assets will always be equal to your equity plus liabilities. Is it now clear? Yeah, no, it's clear. We, we can continue. Thanks, James. Uh, so James? Yes. Yeah. Uh, now, if we have to minus the 100,000, which is interest on the loan, then does that mean now that's also going to be a liability? Okay, let me do it this way. Okay. Let me uh, do sorry. this way. Just give me a second. Okay. All right. Uh, so the last entry that we had was what we had. Uh, I think it was now what we know it what it's six hundred thousand, right? Uh, six hundred. Why is it acting up now? We had six hundred thousand cash on this side, and then six hundred thousand equity on this side. After we we paid back the bank, right? And now we we are talking about the interest, right? What is the impact of the interest? Now interest is an expense. Remember, interest is an expense to you. So again, you're going to say what 600,000, right? Minus the 100,000 interest that you have to pay the bank, right? And then I'm going to say it's equals to what? To your equity, 600,000 minus the expense was the loss to you, six of 100,000. And then you end up with what? 500,000 cash is equals to what? 500,000 equity. So that is the last thing that you end up with. But all of this transaction, remember what you're doing. You just bought a house and sold the house. You bought a house for uh, 1,500 and you sold it for, uh, you bought a house for 1 million and you sold it for 1,500. And all of those transactions, you end, the last thing that you end up with is you end up with the cash, 500,000 on one side. It is equity because it belongs to you. If it belongs to someone else, it could have been recorded as a liability, but it is equity because it belongs to you. You have paid the bank back you have paid their interest and you're done with everyone else. You're just left with the cash in your what in your account. Okay. Sure. But like I said, don't worry about these things. I don't think it's going to be asked 
uh, for if you guys with just accounting stuff. I just want to give you a background so that you understand some of the concepts that you see when we start doing the, the workings. All right, so now let's start with the statement of comprehensive income, right? Uh, statement of comprehensive income. Uh, where is it? Statement of comprehensive income. So I just want to check which paper I'll be using for that one. Okay, what this one, business finance. Okay, uh, business finance. All right, so in each and every business that you operate, right? In each and every business that you operate, there are three financial statements that you need to know as a manager. There are three financial statements. The income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. So I'm going to start with the income statement. The income statement is a statement that shows you how much profit you have made as a company over the last 12 months. How much profit we've made as a company over the last 12 months? So that's the what? That's the income statement. That's basically it. How much profit has you made as a company over the last 12 months? Now, the income statement that we are talking about here, it has got a couple of sections that you need to understand, okay? So I'm just gonna, I'm just reducing things here so that it's clear, right? Which sections we're talking about. All right, just give me a second. Let's make them slightly bigger so that you can see what I'm talking about. I'll, I'll expand later. I just want to explain first. So a normal income statement, right? A normal income statement, your starting point is the sales. That's your starting point. You start with the sales of the organization. After you have received the sales, you subtract the cost of sales. But there is a little trick that your lecturer does, right? In terms of your sales, they are what we call sales returns. Sales returns simply means someone took an order and took delivery of your products, but then later on told you that these things were damaged, you know, damaged it, and they retained the product to you. So although you recorded the sale, the product has been retained. So you should subtract that from your sales figure. So whenever you record your sales, you take the sales from your trial balance and you say less returns, right? So once you have your final sales figure, you subtract your cost of sales. So I'm gonna use an example so that it makes sense what we are talking about here. So let's assume that you are, um, which organization can I use? I usually like using things that are simple. Let's use incredible connection, right? Let's assume that you are incredible connection, right? A company that sells computers, right? So incredible connection in their sales, they are simply saying that I have sold 200 computers. That's what they're saying. I've sold 200 computers multiplied by the price of the computers. If the price of the computers was 10,000 rand each, Right. It means that they've sold how much? They've sold 200,000. That's what it means, right? So that's your sales, right? Usually you are told already, you don't need to calculate anything. You are just told what the sales are, right? But just make sure that there are no returns. If there are returns, you adjust for your, for your returns, right? Then once you've recorded your sales, 
you subtract what we call cost of sales. Cost of sales does not mean all expenses. No, 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 no. Cost of sales means what you paid before you could sell the item. So for example, Incredible Connection sells computers. The computers that Incredible Connection sells, they buy them from Samsung, they buy them from Apple, they buy them from Lenovo, they buy them from HP. Incredible Connection does not make computers, but they sell computers. So cost of sales is the money that they paid to their suppliers for those computers. That's cost of sales. So if you subtract cost of sales, then you get what we call a gross profit. You get a gross profit, right? This is not the final profit. This is just gross profit after we've paid off our suppliers, right? So once we have a gross profit, now we want to go into the operations of the business. As the business was operating, did it generate any other operating income? And also, did it have any operating expenses, right? So let's start with other operating income. So when we say other operating income for a particular business, we are simply saying that there is some money that we might receive, which is not normal, but we might receive it as an income. So for example, if you incredible connection, right, they can you can make a deal with them and say, look, I want to take this uh, computer on my account. I want to open an account with incredible connection and I want to take this computer for 3,000 rand. You guys can deduct 1,000 rand this month, then another 1,000 rand next month, and then another 1,000 rand at the end of the what? At the end of the year, right? And if they charge you an interest on that account, 10% interest, the income that they earn from that interest is not part of sales, but it is part of other operating income, right? Or alternatively, incredible connection goes to HP and they buy computers. They are supposed to pay, let's say they're supposed to pay 200,000 for the computers that they bought from HP. But after they've completed their transaction, HP says, oh, this company is a good company to us. Right? Let's give them a discount. And then they refund HP and say, look, on the 200,000 that is paid us, you can take this 10,000 as a discount. So that's other operating income because it's income to them. There was an expense, but now it's big as income to them. Right. Or incredible connection. Remember, they sell computers and cell phones. But when they are selling computers and cell phones, you can also want telecom line. You can want Vodacom line in there. Right. They can give you a Vodacom line or a telecom line. And you pay for that. Right. So they make a sell, but it's not their product. Right? At the end of the day, when they go back to Vodacom, they can get a commission for the number of Vodacom lines that they've sold in a particular month. That's commission income. Right? Or another alternative. James took a computer in 2018, decided not to pay for three years. Incredible connection, thinking James will never pay back the money, canceled James' debt. James grow a guilty conscience and decided, I want to pay back incredible connection. In 2024, James comes back with 3,000, gives incredible connection. But according to their books, they already removed it. Remember, we talked about the, uh, the issue of realization, the issue of matching and whatnot of conservatism, right? We talked about the issue of conservatism. They've removed James from their books because they knew James is broke, does not have the money, right? But now James has come back and paid back the money. What do they do with the money that James has paid? They record it as bad debt recovered. That's other operating income, right? Or alternatively, they have a car, incredible connection. They have a vehicle that they have, right? So that vehicle that they have, they are using it to make deliveries. They bought it for 500,000 and they've used it for five years. They think the vehicle is now valueless according to their accounting books. The vehicle is now valueless. It does not add value to them at all. So they decided to dispose it. But in disposing it, someone says, oh, I can pay you 10,000 for the car, right? And they get 10,000. But they said it was zero value. So they now have profit when they dispose the vehicle. That's other operating income, right? So. Uh, there's also a, a provision for bad debts, right? So provision for bad debts, remember we said that if you think someone might not pay, you might subtract and say provision for bad debts. So if last year you had provision for bad debts of 50,000, then this year you think, oh, things have improved. The economy has improved. Let's not put 50,000 under provision for bad debts, but rather let's put 20,000, which means it has decreased, which means you 
positively think things are going to be better. So that's also recorded as other property income, the difference between the two. If it was 50,000 before, now it's 20,000, there is a 30,000 difference. That 30,000 difference, the decrease in provision for bad debts, you need to record it as an income. So all of these things fall under other operating income. So I'm gonna hide them again, right? So we said gross profit. After gross profit, you add other operating income. After adding other operating income, your total is going to be called gross operating income for the company. That's your total gross operating income. Then you subtract expenses. Now these are all of your other expenses expect, expect interest, all of your other expenses, right? So your wages, your bank charges, your motor expenses, your ad advertising, your donations, your insurance. There are some funny things they will discuss about them later. You subtract them. So those are your operating expenses. So you subtract all of your operating expenses, all of them, right? Once you have subtracted all of your operating expenses, you end up with a what? with a operating income, right? So I'm gonna say here, less total operating expenses, right? So you're gonna end up with a operating profit now. So again, gross profits, add operating income, you get gross operating income. Gross operating income, less operating expenses, you get an operating profit. Operating profit is also known as EBIT, which means earnings before interest and tax earnings before interest and tax. Now that you have the operating income, this is a very, very important, I wanna put it in red, because most of the things that you might do, you will notice you might need to use what is called operating income. This is where you get it, your operating profit, right? So your operating profit, after you've received it, now you look at your interest. So interest income, you add any interest income from your fixed deposits and whatnot. Interest expenses, you subtract any interest expenses from the loans that you have, and then you get your net profit. If it is a company, it needs to pay taxes. You subtract your taxes, and then you get your net profit after tax. Now we want to do the exam, but are there any questions? Yeah. Are there any questions before we go to the exam? Yes, uh, James. Uh -huh. uh, I think I, I uh, think you, 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 you lost me a bit on a, uh, when you are still up there on you when you when you you're dealing with the debts uh, under uh, the income okay uh which one they're on the on the on the income so on the income they, yeah the the, the, the uh, other uh, operating income so you said something like let's say you put aside uh, fifty thousand for the mm -hmm. bad debts now you said now you look at the economy and you see that it's good then you mm -hmm. decide that it's no longer 50 percent it's no longer uh, it's no longer going to be fifty thousand let's mm -hmm. say it's going to be uh, thirty thousand uh, mm -hmm. then you take twenty thousand is going to fall under your, mm -hmm. your 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 other income so now is it something that has to do with assumption yes yes it's an assumption that you keep so, so if now, you have got a data account right you have, you have any business that you have and you are offering credit, an assumption that you make. Hello? Yes, no, I'm, I'm listening. Okay, listening. there's an assumption that you make that out of all of my data, how many of them will not pay? That's the assumption that you are, that you make. How many of them will not what? Will not pay me back my money? Right. So if you assume that out of my 200,000 in data, right, I'm assuming 50,000 of them will not pay me my money. You open an account called provision for bad debts in accounting. You open an account called provision for bad debts. You are saying that no matter what happens, I'm saying 50,000 of these people will never pay me back my money. Right. So I'm opening an account called provision for bad debts. So if that account, the value in that account reduces, because that account is an expense to you as an organization. So if it reduces, it means things are favorable. If it increases, it means things are not favorable. So decrease in provision for bad debt is favorable to you, but you only record the difference. You only record the difference. So if it was 50,000 before, 
and now it is 40,000, which means that you are saying that there is a favorable movement of 10,000 to you. So you record decrease in provision for bed debts, favorable 10,000. If it increases to 60,000, that's unfavorable because you're saying the economy is bad, people are not going to pay me. That 10,000 unfavorable increase in provision of bed debts. It's actually an expense. You go to your operating expenses there. If you check under my operating expenses, you notice that it's there also, but it's now an increase because that's now what? That's now unfavorable, there it is. You see it? Because it's now what? It's now unfavorable at the end of the day. So if it's favorable, you're saying it's a decrease in provision for bed debts, then it's almost like bed debts recovered. The way you're treating bed debts recovered, it's almost similar to that. Though the difference here is you're recording the difference. You're not recording the total value of the account, but you're recording only the difference, the movement in the account. Whereas bed debts recovered, you record the full amount, but for provision for bed debts, you record the difference that has moved. If it has moved downwards, you record the difference as what is favorable income. If it is moved upwards, you record the difference as unfavorable increase in expenses at the end of the day. I hope you are clarifying. Yeah, no, it's, it's clarified because I think uh, I'm confusing with the with the concept of realization whereby no. now I'm looking at it that it's, it's, it's something that has not been uh, realized. It's just an assumption yet. So yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So you know, some of the concepts will, will clash with each other because realization, conservatism across concepts, they clash with each other quite, quite a lot. Those particular concepts. All right. So now let's go to our question paper here. Uh, we want to do question number. What was question number? What was it? Four. Um, okay. Yes, we said four. So I sent the question paper. All right. Why is it playing now? Yeah, question number four. That's what we want to do here, right? Okay, let me do this here so that this doesn't disturb me. So question number four. Right? Question number four says a trial balance adjustment and additional information below are extracted from the accounting records of Leo traders. So most of the accounting records that you're going to use, it's a trial balance. A trial balance is just a list of all of the balances at the organization, of all of the books at the organization. That's what a trial balance is, right? So use the trial balance, use the adjustments, use the additional information to prepare the statement of comprehensive income for Leo traders for the year ended 28 February. 2021, right? So the first thing, before we go even any further, there are two concepts here. The concept of the accounting entity. Who is your accounting entity here? Your accounting entity is who? Leo Traders. That's the first concept. Your accounting entity is Leo Traders. So be very, very careful when you do your recordings later. You have to make sure that whatever you're recording in this thing, is something related to Leo traders. If it is not related to Leo traders, treat it very, very carefully, right? Uh, next thing is the accounting concept related to the debt, the accounting period. What is your accounting period? It says here, 29 February, 2021, which means you are recording for the full year, one March, 2020 up to, 29 February 2021. Let that be very, very clear. It's 12 months, 1 March 2020, up to 29 February 2021. That's your accounting period. Because those things are very, very important when you start looking at some of the figures later. So we have already applied those two concepts, right? Now let's go to the figures that we are given here. Yes, the exercise was shared in the group. If you check the messages that I sent uh, in the evening, just before the class started, I sent some question papers there. All right. So uh, let's see. We have got here pre-adjusted trial balance. Pre-adjusted trial balance, it means that everything in here is going to be affected by everything below it, which are the adjustments. That's what pre-adjusted means. If it's post-adjusted, it means it has already been adjusted. But if it's pre-adjusted, it means all of these entries, you need to take care of them afterwards. Right? So usually my preference, there are two methods. Method number one, you take all of the adjustments 
you adjust the trial balance and then you prepare. Method number two, you start with the trial balance, you prepare, and then you adjust your figures afterwards. I always feel like starting with the trial balance makes the learning experience easier for the student. So that's what we are going to do. So let's start with the trial balance, right? So when you are doing your statement of comprehensive income, you go here where it says nominal account section, right? Please be very clear when you're doing your statement of comprehensive income, you go to the nominal account section. Under the nominal account section, you will notice that on the credit side, you see what says debit credit. On the credit side, you've got different incomes. On the debit side, you've got different expenses. Again, on the credit side, credit on top there, you see that? You've got different incomes. On the debit side, you see credit debit on side, you've got different expenses, right? So your incomes on the credit, your expenses on the debit. Now let's go. So remember, I've already told you what the template is supposed to be. Don't worry about the nitty gritties within the template. The items that we are hiding, don't worry about them. Right? I'm gonna put them in yellow so that you don't uh, end up getting confused, right? These items, this is what I'm saying, don't worry about them. Because they are different for each company. It's just for learning purposes, right? That I've included <coughs> all these items. They can be different for each company. It just depends on the company that you're working. Some companies don't pay adverts. Some companies don't pay rentals. It just depends, right? But the normal headings apply. So let's start with the first one. The first one just is sales. Just right. a quick one, James. Do mm -hmm. we have to know the formula or the formula will be given to us? Formula for? Um, for the income statement and how to do it. In, in, in the case of an exam or a um, test or whatever, do they give you the formula or we have to know the formula? The, the unfortunate part is I can't really answer the question because I don't know. It depends. Sometimes your lecturer, when he sends the exam paper, it has a template already. Sometimes it has a template. You just complete the template. Sometimes it does not have a template. So unfortunately, I can't really answer that. I don't know whether he's going to give it to you or he's not going to give it to you. But it's very straightforward. You don't need to worry. You remember, it's an open book exam. So you can always double check in the exam. You can always come back to these templates that I've given you, or you can check in your study guide that starts during the exam. You don't need to really worry because it's an open book exam. All right. Now, I think I think the issue here, James, is you are doing it on Excel. Can you yes, do sir. it manually? Sorry? I was saying the issue here is you are doing it on the Excel. Can you do it manually? Yes, you can do it manually if you want. I mean, on your side, so that we can understand it easily. Because some of us, for the first time doing it, these things, we don't understand it very well. So when you are, when you are using Excel, I mean Excel. Okay, what's the issue exactly with the Excel? When you calculate uh, using the Excel, it's become difficult for us to understand it. But if you can you do it manually, I think it's much better to understand it. I'm still not, I'm not, I'm still failing to understand where the issue is. Sorry, sorry, I'm not still failing. Because it's the same thing. The only difference is the Excel will just automatically add for you. Because I'm trying to reduce the adding part because it does not add value, it's just adding. Yeah, so James, yeah. And I think James on Excel again it's easier because you can hide something and also do something. On the word format is gonna be difficult because you have to type everything and remove and do something. I think it's better we do it on Excel and it's gonna be faster. Yeah, because it's gonna be way faster. If we do it manually, I don't want to like you adding these numbers manually. It's going to take us two hours to finish this thing. I don't want to lie there because I don't see the value of doing it. But I'll try. If there's any way where I lose you, please highlight. You can highlight that you have lost me here and then we'll explain. Because yeah, I'm doing it manually, I don't like you. It's gonna take us. Ages. No, I think Excel is uh, okay for us. All right, sure. Okay, so just before, okay. before you before you continue, the first question that was asked about the income statement being the uh, something that is either given or I just I just wanted to know mm -hmm. uh, is this income statement not a standard 
way of doing it. Like for instance, you can't change things on it. Yeah, it's standard. It's very, very standard. That's why I was saying that it's not that difficult. It's very, the only thing that is different in income payment. Do you see this thing that I've highlighted in yellow these days? Yes, I see that then, uh, no, yes. I, I'm, I'm fine now. Yes. Yeah, the, the things that are violated in yellow are the only things that are not standard in an income statement. Everything else, you're going to have sales, you're going to have less cost of sales, you're going to have gross profit, you're going to have uh, a, a ed operating other income, you're going to, everything else is standard. The only thing that is not standard is what is the actual income and what is the actual expenses, because it depends with your company. Because you can, some companies have stationary, some companies don't have stationary. That's the only thing that is not standard. But everything else is standard. Everything else is standard. All right, sure. All right. So we start with the sales, right? So we start with the sales, right? right? How much are our sales? How much are our sales? Um, 830. Yes, 830. So we come here in our income statement. Where it says sales, we write. 830, right? But remember what I said, right? 830 mm -hmm. in itself is not correct because there might be some returns. So what are our returns? Do we have thousand? Thousand. thousand. So which means we say what? 830, right? 830 minus 5,000. 5, so that's what we... We so say that, right? We say in terms of our workings. So we can record that. That gives us 825. I hope we are together there when we go to the 8.54. Right? So that's point number one. Right? We go to the next thing. The next thing says less. Sorry, sorry, James. Uh -huh. James, sorry. Uh -huh. And the 825, does it go to the debit or the credit side? No, there's no debit, there's no credit in the income statement. It's just one thing. Hmm? It's just this one column. Okay. This one column here, I will highlight it in blue. You just Hi, have James. one column. Yes. One column. Yeah. Hi, James. Yes. Where did you get the eight? eight, 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 eight. I can't. What did I get? I, I was having a problem with network, and then I have to log it out. And then, can you please explain to me where did you get the, the sales? That eight twenty five and eight thirty. Uh, do, do you see the 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 word the, the PDF on the left on the right? Yes. Do you see where it says sales? Mm, if maybe you can scroll up. Under okay. nominal account section, Mama. Under what? Oh yeah, nominal. Yes, yes. Do you see? Oh okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it was not. Visible. Right. Thank you. Sure. All right. So, can I please their mics, mute themselves because we're receiving an app. All right. Sure. Okay. So now we have what? We have eight thirty less five thousand, and we have got our what? Our sales, right? The next thing says here less the cost of sales. So, what is our cost of sales? Three hundred and seventeen thousand six hundred. Right. So three one seven six hundred. Straightforward. Nothing there. Right. I've put it as negative. I know your lecturer likes it to be in brackets. You can always change that setting. If you are doing manually, you can write it in what in brackets. But I'll just highlight here is red so that it's clear. It's negative. Right. Sorry, so sorry, James. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. So um, your sales return. Is it possible that they can give you um? They cannot put it there. They cannot put it there. Like it's just if sales. you have yeah. if you have no sales returns, then it means that you don't need to subtract anything. If you have no okay. sales returns, then you don't need to subtract anything. But if you have what you have to be careful is wording. Sometimes you may not say sales returns, sometimes you might say merchandise returns. That's another word. Mm -hmm. Okay. Merchandise. Merchandise returns. That's sometimes what it says. Merchandise returns. Right, sharp. Okay, I continue. Um, so now remember, we say it sells less cost of sales for us to get gross profit. I hope we are clear there. Sells less cost of sales for us to get gross profit, right? So I'm just going to take that figure there and that figure there. 
and then I end up with five or eight. I hope we are clear where we got the five or eight for. Sales, less cost of sales for us to what to get grass profit. Right. We go to the next one. We said after we get our gross profit, we add other operating income. We add other operating income. And I've listed to you examples of other operating income to make it easier for you to identify them. But another way of identifying other operating income is checking the things that are on the, remember, credit side. We said everything on the credit side is an income. So let's check the things on the credit side. We've got sales on the credit side. We've got interest on fixed deposit on the credit side. Then we've got interest rent income on the credit side. So does any of these things match what I've talked about here? So you can see yes. I've got rent income, right? It matches, right? So how much is our rent income? 5,900. No, 8,600. So it's 8,600, right? So that's our rent income. So I can delete all of these things because remember this was a template. Right, I can just hide these things because I no longer need them anymore. Right, because they are not there. Right, but I want you to take something. I've deliberately ignored something. Do you see that there was interest on fixed deposits, but it was not on the things that I listed here? Do you see that? Yep. Interest yep. on yes. fixed deposit, but it was not part yep. of the things I listed. Why? Because interest on fixed deposit is recorded separately. It's recorded under, if you go remember, at the bottom there, we talked about interest. We said interest income and interest expense. So that is where you record interest on fixed deposit. It's not recorded under. Oh, okay. So that is why I have ignored it for now. We're going to come back to it later. I've ignored it for now for that particular word, for that particular reason, right? So now our other operating income, we now have the other operating income. Are we happy there? Rent income? Yes. I can say rent here. Just to be clear, rent, other operating income. So remember, it's gross profit and other operating income. So we are saying here our 500 and something thousand plus our 8,000 here, and we get 574,000. I hope I didn't lose anyone. All right, I'll continue. No. No, we're good. All right. Um, so, can you ask me a yes, is that no, a question? I'm a little bit more. I lost you. Is that a question? No, I, um, I, I lost you there with the, with the rent on sales. You lost us on rent. rent. Yes, yes. Do you see where uh, the last thing on the on the PDF document, the last entry on the PDF document? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, that's rent income. Rent that's income. what. Oh, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Sure. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. I'll proceed. Um, sorry, okay. James. I was yes. maybe just to give um, the other thing probably that will make it easier. It's maybe if we can open our phones because um, it's the first question paper that you've sent today. Mm -hmm. If maybe like we get a little bit lost, maybe just for the lady who's, um, because it looks like um, she's, she's battling to see on the screen. Oh, okay, all right, sure. So you can, you can access it on your phone, it's on the group. I sent it to the group, the first paper that I sent on the group. You can also access it on the phone. All right, sure, I'll proceed. Now we want to go to operating expenses. Now, remember what I said, all of these things don't need to be there. You just have to select what is there only, right? You just have to select what is there only because this is just a template. These are different types of expenses just to help you out. But you might have something that is different, right? So to make things faster, I'll just go through the list, right? So I'm gonna go here, salaries and wages. That's an expense for an organization. So salaries and wages, I'm going to record 235,000, right? Salaries and wages, 235,000, right? And then uh, bed debts, bed debts, that's another expense, 
seven five, right? Stationary. That's another expense there. I'm gonna record it there. Stationary, uh, two thousand. Uh, rates and taxes paid. Rates and taxes paid. I've got twenty-three thousand. Motor expenses. Motor expenses paid. I've uh, twelve eight hundred. Marketing expenses. Marketing expenses. Do I have marketing? Right. I'm just gonna record here. Marketing expenses. Right. Nine four hundred. Telephone expenses. Of telephone year, 17,800. Electricity and water, electricity and water, 26,700. Bank charges, bank charges, I've got 3,300. Insurance, I've got 2,600. 